tonight, the show that remembers when Scotland had bad weather and Australians won Wimbledon. <laughs> tonight I'll be joined by comedian Josh Thomas, journalist Lee Sales and singer-songwriter Paul Kelly. Plus there's musical comedy from Rusty and another guy and a one-on-one -on -one interview with 80s pin-up Molly Ringwald. <laughs> Before we get on with the show, though, there were two things that happened last week that provoked an instant online response from our viewers. The first was when Hannah told the following joke. What cheese do you use to lure a bear out of a cave? Camembert. <laughs> it's even funny the second time. <laughs> Uh, it inspired a whole bunch of cheese-related jokes that were sent in to us that included Catherine Pearson's There was an explosion at a cheese factory in France. All that was left was debris. <laughs> uh, KB, who said, What does a cheese say when it looks at itself in the mirror? Hello, me. <laughs> and our favourite from Pete Cornelius, What sort of cheese do you use to hide a horse? Mascarpone. <laughs> Clearly, that's what you want. <laughs> the other thing that people responded to last week were Les Murray's views on asylum seekers. And in fact, a few people even said they had changed the way they viewed asylum seekers after Les's description. Which kind of got me thinking. The reason asylum seekers is an election issue is that people are afraid of them. And the reason people are afraid of them is that both sides of politics have told us to be. And the reason they tell us to be afraid is so they can make it an election issue. Now, statistics would suggest that the amount of refugees coming in is such a tiny percentage we've got nothing to be afraid of. But... Most Aussies couldn't give two hoots about statistics. We're more interested in the footy. <laughs> so it seems to me that if asylum seekers arrived in Australia wearing club colours, they'd be welcomed a little more warmly. <laughs> no, you, I think no Magpies fan is going to turn back a black and white boat full of people singing good old Collingwood forever. <laughs> In fact, maybe the whole thing should be turned into a sporting event. Last weekend, thousands of people turned up to watch the Darwin Beer Can Regatta. <laughs> Just imagine how many would flock to see the inaugural Jakarta to Darwin refugee raft race. <laughs> Channel 9 can cover it, Grant Denyer can host it, and Tom Waterhouse can take bets on the winner. <laughs> See it now, thousands of Aussies lining in the shoreline of the Gulf of Carpentaria shouting, Come on, Hassan! Come on! Do it for freedom! Do it for a new life! But do it because I've got a hundred bucks on you! <laughs> if it all goes well, maybe one day we'll see Kevin Rudd in a newspaper jacket sprayed with Shiraz saying, Any official who kicks out an asylum seeker today is a bum. <laughs> I'm not alone in thinking this, by the way. Former Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser announced this week he'd be supporting a Greens candidate at the next election. Malcolm Fraser supporting a Greens candidate. There are young people here who have no idea what that means. <laughs> That's like watching Tony Abbott in 30 years' time on a float at Mardi Gras. <laughs> Let's get on with the show and welcome the woman who last week took part in Naked Tuesday and quickly followed it up with, oh my God, what have I done Wednesday? It's Hannah Gatsby! <laughs> Hannah. What have you had a go at this week? I had a go at something important this week, mm -hmm. Adam. Um, I firmly believe that we're heading toward an apocalypse. Um, it, you know, it could be nuclear, pandemic, zombie is what I've got my money on. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I happen to know that fat people with glasses do not flourish under these circumstances. I mean, I've read Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what that's all about. So uh, I decided to have a go at survival, ba learning basic survival skills, so I can, you know, you know, restart civilization. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally filled with doom like me, it's never too soon to prepare for the apocalypse. So today, I'm going to learn how to survive humanity's downfall. Hi, Hannah. My teachers will be the organisation that has been teaching raw animalistic survival since 1910. The girl guides. Oh, we made you a bad channel. <laughs> <laughs> What's in the box, ladies? S'mores! Is that ammo? 
I thought jungle law would include more knife fights in clearings and shelters made out of bones, not hot biscuits. On the other hand, heroes need energy. I bet a track that yours is not poisoned. I bet a track that yours is not poisoned. I'm saving your life right now. The pioneer spirit seems to be alive and well in these young women. They seem ready to suck the marrow out of life and the venom out of limbs. This is Challenge Valley. It has the most misleading title since The Best of Vanilla Ice. If I can't nail this glorified jungle gym, I might as well just crack my own brain open and serve it with a side salad to the zombie horde. Shh, the enemy's coming. It quickly became clear to me that these girl guides are tiny ninjas, and in the future, they will be our masters. Oh, I appear to be stuck. Is that a pull of fire brigade? Stop pressuring me. Yes! No, 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 no. Where's Hannah gone? I don't know. Oh well. No matter what happens in humanity's bleak future and also the ABC studio, at least I know there's one aspect of survival at which I excel. So you had a go at Girl Guides and you ate their biscuits. Yeah. And that's pretty much all you did. Yeah, I didn't even pay for them. <laughs> I'm appalled, so I'm going to put you head to head with two of the guides. Would you please welcome Tess and Lulu? Yeah. Uh, Hannah, if you'd like to make your way over to the tent, there are tents in front of each of you. Uh, you have to erect that tent as quickly as possible, then run over to the flagpole and uh, raise the Hannah has a go flag once you've put the tent up. <laughs> Hannah? Oh, you're just assuming they're going to raise it, are you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did direct a lot of that to <laughs> to be honest. Oh, yeah, you have little faith. <laughs> On your marks, get set, go. Oh! Instructions. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> She's heckling me. Cheese and whiskers. This is a double test for you, Hannah. This is not just direct attempt, this is also don't swear in front of the children. <laughs> Feel free to cheer for whoever you think may actually win. Hey, thanks, man. <laughs> oh. Oh, well. Where's my other sticks? I've lost my sticks. Hannah, there's one of you, and yet you're doing more arguing than the two of them. I found them. I found them. Come on, Lulu. You can do it. Oh. Okay, the girls are doing pretty well. We can do it. Witchcraft. Are you putting a cover over the top? Is that what that is? Cool, OK. Where are you up to, Hannah? I think she's about done. <laughs> Hannah, the girls may be doing a better tent, but you have done a remarkable Sydney Harbour Bridge. <laughs> yeah, thanks, mate. Oh, where's this? That's it. Oh, no. OK, oh, the girls no. are done. <laughs> Lulu and Tessa, you did win. Hannah clearly didn't uh, learn anything, but you do have something for her, is that right? Congratulations, you got a certificate for doing Challenge Valley. Thank you, Lulu. <laughs> this is the outdoors badge. The um... outdoors badge, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, would you please thank Hannah Gadsby? Yeah! My first guest tonight is a comedian whose ABC series was called Please Like Me and whose current stand up show is called Douchebag. We think he might have some issues. Please welcome Josh Thomas.
why have you called your show Douchebag? Um, well, there's two reasons. Uh -huh. One is because people kept bringing 12-year-olds to my show because they've watched me on Talking About Your Generation and then thought like, it was going to be like a, a fun, like, wacky show where like, I pour chocolate on my head and giggle, but then it's like about sex a lot. Um, <laughs> so they kept bringing 12-year-olds. I put swear words in. And the other reason is just, I, just, I just was getting worried that I was, gonna, I was becoming a douchebag. <laughs> I was going to become a bad, a bad part. Do you ever get that? That I, that I think I'm a bad person? No, you just get worried that... Well, this Do is... I get worried that you're a bad person? <laughs> Do you ever get worried that I'm a bad person? Oh, all the time. <laughs> I follow you on Twitter. What do you think? <laughs> I've done nothing bad on Twitter. Are you talking about I got in trouble last week? You got in trouble last week for tweeting directly insults to Tony Abbott. Borderline insults. I mean, they were hardly... What, this is what hang happened. on, hang on. Let, let me check whether, whether no, these uh, words are an insult. No, you, Tony I'm... Abbott, you suck. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, that has actually smuggled over the border. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I get worried. Because like, very occasionally I pay attention to politics, right? And right. I did, like, last week, I just got a bit angry at Tony Abbott because it's quite an easy thing to do. And I, sp I specifically got angry about him when he talks about refugees, right? Because it's quite a big, complicated issue and it's really, it really was making me sad because people, like, they die and we've got, like, kids in detention and it's, like, it's difficult, right? And no matter what you want to do, it, you should understand that it's difficult and just saying stop the boats over and over again is, like, that's a dickhead move, right? So... <laughs> But that's, that's quite a difficult thing to put into 140 characters or less. So, <laughs> instead, I said to him, I said, Hey, Tony Abbott, uh, stop the boats. More like stop your mama from coming around my place for sex. <laughs> <laughs> Even an ABC audience went, Oh, now that's mean to Tony Abbott. <laughs> it, got on, it got on the cover of Melbourne's Herald Sun. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> That's not news. That's not news. Are you a mama joke to Tony Abbott? It's not news. That is... If I read these articles, why is old media dying? That's why it's dying. <laughs> not interesting. But, okay, you know that, gonna... like, but you know that when you do it, like, like when you say, like, your mama at the beginning, yeah. the rest of the sentence is nonsense, right? Like, that was not a comment. I'm not implying that me and Tony Abbott's mother have, like, a long time any relationship at all. It's, <laughs> it's not a comment on... Because I got a lot of hate mail. I got, like, um, 1,688 tweets that day, and I reckon about 1,000 of them were just bringing up that I was a fag. FYI, Josh, you're a fag. But... I know. Coming, coming, like, like no, I just don't think me saying to him, you suck, is nearly as offensive as him saying to me, no, no, you can't marry him. Like, it's just not. They're not on par. Look, my producer just went, this isn't Q&A, move on. <laughs> in, in what ways are you a douchebag? Well, I was going to become a douchebag because I bought, I bought... I've got three chickens, right? They're called Melinda and Genevieve and Adele, and I bought them when they were one day old, right? And yeah. I'm, like, a decent guy I, all the, most of the time. Like, I do nice things. Like, if there's, like, like, a little bit of poo on the side of the toilet bowl, you know, like, I'll pee it off, whatever. Like, I, I do... <laughs> I, I do my best to make the world a nicer place if I can. Most of the time. But then what happened was on the first day I was holding Melinda, the tiniest chicken that I owned, and I was looking at her and thinking like how beautiful she is and like how much I'm gonna love and care for her. And then just for a second I couldn't help it, my inner monologue thought like, I could crush you to death. <laughs> and like I kind of enjoyed that feeling of like power. Like, like, like I am your god, Melinda, you know, like, make me some breakfast, bitch. So and that, it was just like, it was a nanosecond of my life, but it just set off this thing where I was worried that that was, like, the beginning of a spiral. Because I didn't, like, I didn't crush her to death because I don't like crushing my pets to death, but also I didn't used to like olives, you know? <laughs> right, OK. And why those particular names for your chickens? Belinda, Genevieve and Adele. Yeah. Well, I named them after my three best female friends, but I, 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 I'm sorry, you, I, I should have called one Hannah. I'm sorry, we are good friends. Anyway. Oh, that'd be one clumsy chicken. <laughs> You know, I like, wouldn't lay eggs. Me and, Hannah went, me and Hannah went on a full hike when you were doing that, setting up that tent before. It was really uh, it was nostalgic. We went on yeah. six, six days and five nights over a mountain. Hannah walking in front of me and but, me walking behind her, just like yapping and yapping and yapping the whole time. <laughs> and, and her occasionally grunting, exactly like Donkey and Shrek. Just. <laughs> 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 So you do love your chickens, and you also love your dog. Well, you know, actually, I, I, I'm, because I bought them because I feel like, because I, I like meat, and I'm really interested in food, and I was like, I need to, like, farm a thing, like an animal, in my backyard and get, like, to know what that's like. And, and I was planning on, like, 
eating them one day. I'm planning on eating them one day. I think it's important if you eat meat to one day like come to terms with what you're doing. Yeah. And I was really worried that was going to be like emotionally like difficult. But I don't actually like them that much. They're quite mean. They always they always peck me. <laughs> they always peck me. And now I, I'm fine. I would, I would eat them. <laughs> they're not that, that likable. <laughs> So what I've learned is don't get on Josh's bad side or he will... I will eat you. He will cook and eat you. Or, or if I don't have access to you, I will tweet you middling insults. That's what I'll do. So you, should, you should be cooking and eating politicians and tweeting the birds. <laughs> um, but you also, you do love your, jo your dog, John. Yeah, who... he's better than the chickens. He's my favourite. Why did you call your dog John? No reason. Okay. But people think that I called him John because my last name's Thomas. And they think I called him John Thomas because that's like old, old school slang for a... For a, for a, for a bee. I don't know why. I, I don't know why I whispered that. I said everything. The rest of the interview allowed. I'm always trying to like. Um, I didn't bring him in today, but usually, I, usually I tried. I tried it to the producer. I was like, "You don't want me to bring John?" And she was like, "You don't need. It's fine." <laughs> like, I try and squeeze him onto every show. Yeah, he was on your show. Please like me. He was on Please Like Me. He's an incredible actor. Incredibly talented. Actor. We have a scene of his incredible oh, acting. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going to have some fun? I'm not allowed to drink, Peggy. Oh, nonsense. No, the doctor says I'm not supposed to drink. Well, how is someone supposed to stop being depressed if you can't drink? <laughs> oh, ah, somebody sensible. John, do you think she should have a drink? John? He doesn't care. <laughs> That's my baby. <laughs> I want to show this photo just to prove how much, how close you are to your dog. <laughs> That's my dream best friend. That's what that is. <laughs> Have you seen cat beard photos? Yeah. <laughs> there are photos on the internet it's similar to that where people actually use, put their cat in front of them, put their head behind the cat, and the cat, it ends up looking like the cat is actually their beard. There are a lot of blank faces. I'll give you an example. Uh, in fact, I want you to rate these out of ten as far as cat beard photos go, please, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I give it a six because it's the beginning. I want somewhere to go. OK, so that's yeah. a six. Here's the next one. <laughs> yeah, that's an eight. That's an eight. That's an eight. That's an eight? Yeah. OK. Uh, there are also dog bearding photos, oh, which I'll move on to. I was getting worried about that. Well, that's... <laughs> nine. That's a nine. A nine? OK. What one more. Thing? One more dog beard. <laughs> yeah, it's a ten. That's a 10, right? I think that's a 10. What, what we did find on the internet, though, is a reverse cat beard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of my so favorites. Handsome. So, listen, why, why are you auctioning a cake at every show that you do around Australia? I, I make a cake at the end of my show. We auction it off for charity, right? Yeah. Um, because it just as like a penance for all the bad things I've done in my, in my life, because I talk about them in the, over the hour. And we've raised, like, about 16 grand with rubbish cake, which is pretty good. And it is amazing, because I do follow you on Twitter, and every couple of nights I'll see a tweet come in from you going, I've just performed in Wollongong and they've paid like $350 for yeah. a cake. Yeah, the most someone paid for a cake was Perth, obviously, because they're the only city that has like um, a proper economy at the moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, so, we, we, $600 Perth paid. Incredible, right? 600 bucks for, for a one cake. rubbish cake. I'm not, I've, I've been on Master Chef Ready, Steady Cook and Come Dine With Me, and I came last place in all of them. Like, dead last. Like, I'm not good at it. And uh, I brought you one. I brought oh, you really? one. Yeah, and, of and, and it should be pointed out, you make these cakes yourself. It's since January. I'm actually getting, I'm getting a bit sick of it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harley, would you like to bring on the cake that uh, Josh made for us today? Hey, Harley. <laughs> but this is quite... I don't know why he stood up. But this is a good one. This wasn't baked with moderate loathing. This was baked with love. Oh, that's beautiful. It's chocolate cake with salted butter, caramel frosting and, and coconut. Oh, look, there's people <laughs> clutching each other's knees saying they would like the cake. Do you, we... wanna, do you want to auction one off now? Should we, we auction, auction one off? off now? So it goes to UNICEF. To UNICEF? Yeah. Yeah, should we have an do auction in the, the, in the studio? The cake? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to bid on the cake? A dollar thirty. That's humiliating. <laughs> Ten dollars. Here we go. Seventeen. Fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. Oh, it's like a block finale. This is good. One hundred. Oh, don't gosh. you know each other? You, you can share it. One fifty. Oh. Wow. One seventy-five. One seventy-five. Go once. One seventy-five. Go. 
Knights, 190. Oh. Are that's you like... from Perth? No. <laughs> That's not a lot of money to pay to look like a champion on the television, though, right? So like a nice, yeah. nice bus, $190. $191. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take uh, 200 200 200 Oh, wow, OK. It's really on Hannah. Once. I don't want it. At 260 260 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you could just come over. Yeah. <laughs> you just come round. Oh, just go. $35. 300 <laughs> Three hundred dollars going once. Three twenty. Three twenty. Oh. Do you want to just cut it in half? <laughs> three fifty going once, twice, three times. Sold for three fifty. Thomas! My second guest tonight is one of Australia's foremost political journalists. She could crack a walnut just by asking it the right question. Please welcome the host of 7.30, Lee Sales! <laughs> We both have causes to be a little bit grumpy with Kevin Rudd <laughs> uh, because of the whole leadership spill and everything. Because two weeks ago, it meant uh, 7.30, then just became 9.30, became 10.30, became the whole night, and we didn't go to air. <laughs> then it also meant last week you were supposed to have, like, a, a week off. I was supposed to have a week off, and, um, yeah, thanks to Kevin, it got cancelled. So, you know... Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't bring that up in the interview with really. him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, uh, let's start, Prime Minister, with my holiday that you've ruined. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you cope that night of the leadership spill? Because you were on air for, like, what, four hours? Close to four hours. It's funny, the, the thing that I have mostly been asked by people is how did you stay on live TV that long and not need a toilet break? That's the number one thing people on Twitter seem to be asking about. And it was funny, the day before um, doing that show, I'd been interviewing Russell Crowe about his movie Man of Steel and he told quite a long anecdote about um, how once he got into his costume, it took four people and he had four layers of spandex and then he was not allowed to go to the toilet for nine hours. And as we were approaching hour four of the coverage, I was thinking, oh, God, what did Russell say about how you don't go to the toilet? <laughs> it's not often you can be desperate for the loo and think, what did Russell Crowe say? <laughs> So how do you deal with the politician spin? Because your job is trying to get people to answer questions they don't want to answer. How do you do that every night? Hey, look, it's hard because obviously I'm trying to get them to speak as frankly as I can and they're often trying to not speak very frankly. So you have these weird exchanges where it's like me saying, um, well, Adam, what did you have for breakfast today? And you say, well, Lee, for lunch I had a salad sandwich. And I'll say, that's not what I asked. I asked what you had for breakfast. Well, Lee, I answered your question. For lunch I had a salad sandwich. And so you have this sort of bizarre exchange that's a bit surreal that you have to try to bust them out of. And so it bears not a lot of resemblance to any normal social interaction. You know, you would never in a normal conversation with somebody interrupt them and say, well, Adam, you haven't answered my question. Or there's the sort of things that I do on television. So it can be quite socially awkward. But I just try to keep in the, in the forefront of my mind that I'm there to try to get answers that I think, you know, the average member of the public would want to know. And so what, what, what is going on in the politician's mind? Are they thinking, if I just evade this for long enough, she'll give up? <laughs> Sometimes I think that they're thinking, look, this can't go for too much longer and so if I just filibuster here, you know, she's going to need a toilet break or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sometimes I think they're trying to fill time. Sometimes I think that they have got a, a certain line that they want to stick with or they sometimes, I think, understand perhaps what the weakness in their position is and so they're trying to not give ground. So it's this bit of a, a dance, I suppose, where you both are a bit of a, a bit more, I guess, of a boxing match where you're both trying to land a bit of a punch on each other. And so what happens... Because, you know, you are, you are now renowned for just continuously asking that question until you finally get the question you the answer that you want what happens and it looks quite tense <laughs> what happens after the interview when you go you know thank you and they go thank you Lee <laughs> and then there's that moment 
What, how, how do they react Well, about 50% of the time the interview's live and so then you don't have any further interaction, which is actually preferable. Yep. Um, and then the other 50% of the time you have this really awkward where, you know, I've just asked horrible things like, how does revenge taste, Kevin? You know, these horrible <laughs> sorts of things. And then it finishes and you're like, um, OK, well, thanks very much. Thanks for coming in. Um, see you next time. And they're like, OK see you next time. Or sometimes there's someone will have a slightly pursed lip or might pull their earpiece out a little bit tersely. So it's really quite awkward, that last bit. I, I, I just want that to be over as quick as possible. Wow. It's like, <laughs> weirdly, it's like a horrible one-night stand. <laughs> do you wear earpiece? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't do anything without a producer telling yeah. them <laughs> what to do. So <laughs> <laughs> <Enjoy. laughs> Oh, the amount of times I've been in bed with someone and just heard, it's all right, we can edit that bit out. Right. <laughs> it's not Q&A. <laughs> it seems to me that a politician is clearly stalling and trying to formulate an answer, and the way they get around that is to say, well, Lee, and use your name, because that never happens in conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes I think people have been told... I think there's research that shows that if you use someone's name a lot, they feel more warmly towards you. So if I were calling you Adam a lot, you know, you'd start to feel more warmly towards me. Right. But it doesn't really work. But sometimes I notice people will say Lee, um, you know, 25, 30 times in the interview, which is quite awkward. And I sort of just stick to... Minister or, you know, Mr so-and-so. I try to keep it very sort of formal at my end. And I guess also I'm just an old-fashioned sort of girl who was brought up that by my parents that you call someone, you know, Mr Hills until they say that you can call them Adam, you know. So yeah. I just call everyone Minister or Ms Gillard or whatever. The only exception is interviews like Russell Crowe where I don't call him Mr Crowe. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty? Rusty. Yeah, Rusty. nice. We're pretty tight. So it must be weird, though. <laughs> It must Your be... audience has got a filthy mind. I know, they're disgusting. Yes, I know. You don't get this at 7.30. <laughs> Having said that, you don't auction cakes. So. <laughs> I think a live audience for 7.30 sometimes would be great because I think when the politicians w would be spinning the answer, you'd get the crowd going, oh, come on. <laughs> Which would be really helpful to me, I think, sometimes. Do you ever go home still in work mode? I do a little bit because you're so focused on what you've been doing. So sometimes I'll get home and... You know, I'll say to my husband, have you stacked the dishwasher? And he'll say, oh, no, no, I didn't have time. And I'll say, but hang on, you said earlier tonight that you would stack the dishwasher. <laughs> and he'll say, I didn't have time. Well, what have you been doing? And so you sort of get into that um, mindset. So how are you combining it all, doing 7.30? And because your, your, your son is how old? He's 18 months. Right. Yep. Um, and I've been back at work since he was six months. Um, look, it's a, it's a stretch, particularly if we've had a rough night and then I'm tired and they, I go to work and they go, oh, you're interviewing, you know, Tony Abbott or Kevin Rudd or Julia Gillard and you think... Oh, that's, I just want to sit there and say, so, Prime Minister, what's happening? <laughs> <You're tired. laughs> I would definitely watch that. <laughs> so, yeah. I might try it. Yeah. Um, but generally, I have got the most chilled out baby in the world. He is the happiest person I've ever met in my life. He really is the most happy, just laid back little guy. So he makes it pretty easy for me. We've actually got a photo of how happy and laid back he is. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he, he sleeps in that position with the hands behind the head. And he also sometimes when we walk down the street, he's a bit bigger than that now, but he'll sit in the pram with the hands behind the head like this, just looking at people and sort of, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing? We call that his hello ladies. <laughs> and in fact, do you know what? I had a look at some promotional photos from the Melbourne Comedy Festival over the last couple of years and I think I found out exactly what he's going to look like in about 20 years' time. Oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't think that's called the Hello Ladies, though. <laughs> oh, back then, I think it might have been. <laughs> Tell us about the John Laws interview. I caught, I caught the end of it, and I remember flicking over going, oh, my God, what has just happened? <laughs> Can you explain for those who didn't see well, it? What, we, what it was in the middle of... Um, I think the story was um, something to do with Alan Jones. It might have been the remark he made about Julia Gillard's dad being ashamed of her. And yep. so it had been running for several days and we were trying to think who would be good to come on and talk about it. And then I said on the conference call one morning, well, what about John Laws? Because, you know, there's two big names in Australian radio, Alan Jones, John Laws. So we invited John and he said no. And then after lunch, his person rang. I don't know if John had had a couple of drinks and he changed his mind. And so she said, John will do it, but only if he can do it from his um, apartment. And, you know, he doesn't want to leave the house and you have to send the crew and all the rest. So we did. And so I was, it was a pre-recorded interview. So I was sitting in the studio waiting to start. And then John came up on the monitor with his 
glass of bourbon and some glasses on, dark glasses on, and the cameraman had framed it so beautifully. There was a naval yard in the background. It looked like John's own personal collection of battleships. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw it there and thought, this just looks gold. It was one of my all-time favourite interviews. He was great. This is the, just the very end of the interview with John Laws. John Laws, thank you very much for making time to speak to us tonight. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it, did you? <laughs> yeah, I loved every minute. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went. So then when I went on John's radio show um, at the end, he said, "Oh, Lou, thanks very much for making time." And I said, "John, did you enjoy it?" And he went, "Oh, I loved it." <laughs> <laughs> and now, so at the end of the day, what TV do you watch? Um, I watch a lot of DVD box sets. I don't really watch mm -hmm. anything live. I can confess the guilty secret that I've watched every um, season of Survivor since it started in 2000. I love Survivor. It's the best political show on television. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's politics with all the boring bits taken out. It's just raw politics. What would you like to see on television? More Adam Hills, obviously. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a better idea. Wow. I reckon um, more, more of 7.30 report displacing Adam Hills. Oh. Oh. That's a leadership Your spill. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask is because there's someone in the audience by the name of uh, Jamie Watts who... Uh, where's Jamie? Hi, Jamie. Oh, wow. How old are you? Ten. OK. Oh. So Jamie said that what she wanted to see was TV commercials that use good actors. <laughs> is this a bugbear of yours? Are you sick of, TV, are you sick of seeing TV commercials with bad acting? Yes, very. OK. okay. So during the week, we contacted Shakespearean actor Richard Piper, uh, dragged him away from the Regent Theatre in Melbourne, where he's performing in King Kong. Uh, and with this little film, we have made your wish come true. <laughs> I'm Crazy Dick. And I've gone completely mad. Here at Crazy Dick's discount warehouse, I'm slashing prices on hardware, homewares, stationery. I've got bargain fever. And I'm passing it on to you. There are brain snapping reductions across the entire range. All stock has been heavily reduced. Some below cost. I must be out of my mind to let this go for less than $2.99. <laughs> I have declared war on high prices and I will not be undersold because nobody undersells Crazy Dick. <laughs> nobody. Crazy Dick's Discount Warehouse, 458 Brassy Street, Footscray. Open seven days. How was that? <laughs> thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Richard Piper. And would you please thank Lee Sales? My musical comedy guests tonight are made up of one of the scared weird little guys and one of the stars of Keating the Musical. Here with a musical tribute to some of their favourite artists, would you please welcome Rusty and another guy. I went to Macca's yesterday I did not have a burger nor a fish fillet I had a Sunday chocolate sundae Ladies and gentlemen, the boss hit my head on a speaker, <laughs> whacked a girl in the face when I did a twirl, cracked my shins on the table. <laughs> I'm getting tired of dancing in the dark. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. Well, if you see a painted sign at the side of the road that says 15 apples for a dollar, <laughs> you should buy those apples. That's quite a bargain. It's cheaper than the supermarket and supporting our farmers. Right, uh, just leave your jukebox yeah. money in the honesty jar at the end of their driveway. I left mine on... Yeah, it's B-52s it. it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shut up. G, G, L, L, O, o J, J, P, 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 P,
Mars is spare. GL or JPBXQ. Large up a bug squad. Large up a bug squad. Hey, do you reckon we maybe just might be able to do a song that isn't 30 years old? <laughs> just one. <laughs> The old, old man ones. of comedy, I know. Can we do a new yeah, one? Yeah, sure, a modern one. What do you yeah, want to do? Yeah, like um, a Katy Perry song. Let's do a Katy okay, Perry song. Okay, yeah. Okay. You're hot and you're cold. You're yes and you're no. You're sympathetic, you're unreasonable. You're tactile, you're imperceptible. You're indolent, you're conscientious. You're affectionate, you're undemonstrative. You're trustworthy, you're disreputable. You're provocative, you're uninflammatory. That is so catchy, that song. <laughs> It's so catchy. Hey, can we just do one more Katy Perry song sure, just because sure. my girls love this one? Just the firework. Which you one? love yeah, firework. firework. Three, four. Do you ever feel like a plastic bag? Nope. Never. <laughs> Once. It's an inanimate object. It has no feelings. Although sometimes, you know, I what? wake up and I go, oh man, I'm feeling so unbiodegradable today. No, you don't. <laughs> I just want to go and clog a dolphin's blowhole. <laughs> Somehow you made that sound sexy. That was fantastic. <laughs> <sexy. laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Gotcha. Gotcha. What would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? I told you they wouldn't stand up and walk out and run. Dreadful. Well, I'll do one. I'll do one. Right. What do I see when you turn out the lights? Well, I can't tell you because you turned out the lights. I get by with a little help from my friends. Ooh, I get high with a little pot from my friends. Ooh, I got hundreds of Facebook friends, but they're not really friends. Just acquaintances and people I haven't seen since school. If you want to see more, visit the website rustyrich.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Rusty and another guy. <laughs> My one-on-one guest tonight was one of the biggest film stars of the 80s, appearing in 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club and Pretty in Pink. She's also a lover of jazz and recently toured Australia playing songs from her album Except Sometimes. So I sat down for a good old chinwag with Molly Ringwald. Molly Ringwald, hello. Hello. Now, you're touring Australia at the moment. Yes. You're doing jazz shows mm -hmm. uh, and you have the album Except Sometimes. Now, for some people, they might think that's a big jump for you. <laughs> yeah. But for you, this isn't a big jump at all. This has been a part of your life for years. Yeah, singing's actually what I started out doing because my father is a, a traditional jazz musician. So I was singing with him from the time I was three and a half, I think, was my first professional performance. Wow, right. And then I uh, sort of segued into acting um, as a teenager and kind of stuck with that for a while. And now I'm back. And I've read that you said that um, uh, jazz music for you is like comfort food. Yeah. It is. It's true. Um, you know, it's the like I'm more likely to eat in a restaurant if they're playing jazz music. Than, right. <laughs> you know, I find it, you know, much more relaxing uh, and appetizing experience. You know, now you're going to be, you know, for the rest of this tour around Australia, walking past restaurants, and they'll see you go, oh, "That's Molly Ring. Put jazz on. Put some jazz I hope on." So. <laughs> so, what song would be ideal for you to to sit down and have a nice meal to? Well, generally. Uh, if we're going to be specific here, uh, I think, um, you know, Brubeck's always nice. Yep. I think, uh, you know, instrumental, I think, is always good. All right, what about a cold winter's day? It's raining outside, the fire's roaring. Mm -hmm. Who do you put on then? I, I think I would probably put on Chet Baker. Yep. I love Chet Baker. I love his voice. I love the way he plays the trumpet. I'm determined to make my uh, my three-year-old boy into a trumpet player. <laughs> I said to my husband the other day, how old do you have to be before you can give them a trumpet? Yeah. I might regret it once I give it to him. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, do you sing jazz to your kids? All, yeah, always. Uh, which songs do they connect with? Well, his song, in fact, he is actually on the album, uh, my son Roman, because uh, I used to sing when he was a baby, I would sing exactly like you. 
that was kind of like his song, you know, right. uh, the Dorothy Fields. You know, I know I have waited, know I've been blue. And he just loved it. So when we were in the studio, I actually had to uh, make him a part of the song in some way. So we brought him into the studio and hooked up a mic and tickled him until he giggled. And so he's credited on the album. Oh, is he actually credited? Yeah, yeah. Outro, <laughs> outro giggle, Roman Ringwald Giannopoulos. <laughs> yeah, they each have songs. And, and sometimes I try out songs on them. Do you find that's a really good gauge of what's a good song? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. But, you know, sometimes if... Uh, Sometimes they're just not in the mood and they'll, you know, just say, you know, itsy bitsy spider, <laughs> ABC, <laughs> stop trying to scat sing. <laughs> I just want, I just want itsy bitsy. <laughs> come on kids, this yeah. is important, this is yeah. cultural. Yeah. Has your dad come and seen you perform? Yes. Every time he's there, I always um, ask him to come up and perform the encore with me. Right. And what song's that? Uh, it's a song that I recorded on his album. Uh, it's called I'll Be Seeing You. Yeah. Which is a total tearjerker. Oh, wow. What's that like? <laughs> the man that inspired you to sing jazz up on stage. I can't, singing... I can't even look at him uh, on stage because I, I get too choked up. Uh, you know, the, the album is dedicated to my dad. He really is, uh, he's just been such a huge musical influence on me. And does he give notes? No, he doesn't. The only thing that he questioned was the, the song, Don't You Forget About Me, which I recorded on the album. <laughs> and he, he wrote me an email and he said, I don't know about that one. Don't know where that one came from. <laughs> Sounds kind of weird, but your sister liked it. <laughs> and I said, Dad, it, you know, it was the song it was from The Breakfast Club. And he said, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I get it. I get it now. Yeah. It's really nice at the end of the album where, you know, you're listening to this beautiful jazz album, and then at the end you go, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, all those, me, yeah, right. And it's a, just a really lovely kind of gentle nudge. Yeah, well, I thought it was just, I mean, it was, it was a nice way to kind of integrate what all of those movies and, and who I'm known as for most people and kind of a way to sort of integrate that into what I'm doing now. There's one more thing that I want to uh, ask you, mm -hmm. and this is got nothing to do with the album or your tour or anything okay. else. You and I have actually met before. Have we? On a show on Australian television called Good News Week. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find out I was on the show until that morning because someone had pulled out. Uh -huh. I knew absolutely nothing about what had been going on in the world. Uh -huh. And you were so well versed. <laughs> I had had about three hours sleep and probably smelt like a man who uh -huh. had been out all night. Uh -huh. And ever since then, I've always just wanted to apologise. <laughs> was I kind? You were so lovely. Oh, good. And you good. knew more about Australian politics and news than did I, I did. I've always felt so bad about letting you down as a teammate. Well, you know, I, I think I've, I've recovered, but You've thank recovered. you. All I've ever wanted to ask you is, are we good? Are we OK? Uh, we're good. We're OK. <laughs> Molly Ringwald, thank you very much. Thank you. My final guest tonight is quite simply one of Australia's greatest ever songwriters. He's done all the dumb things, he's been to her door, gone in leaps and bounds and taught us all how to make gravy. It's an honour to welcome to the show, Paul Kelly. <laughs> Now, from the ducks of your school, okay, you were uh, a champion footballer and cricketer and tennis player. And in amongst all that, you could have done any of those things. Why did you end up making music? Uh, well, I wasn't really a champion footballer. I, liked, I played, I loved footy and cricket and sport. So were they ever viable career options? Oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't. I thought so. I had a bet with my brother that uh, we were, I think it was a dollar bet that one of us would play for Nord Football Club before we either Nord Football Club or make the Australian Test Team before the age of 30. So we both owe each other a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and now look, I've been reading your book, uh, which is uh, How to Make Gravy, and clearly I've got lots of marks in there for things that have stood out for me of interest. It's such a beautiful book. According to this, you get your inspirations from a lot of sources. Now, I understand the Bible, I understand John, the poem, poems of John Donne, I understand even Bon Jovi being an inspiration. How did a movie by Cameron Diaz lead to a song? <laughs> Cameron Diaz and um, Tony Collette. It was a movie called In Her Shoes. Yeah. Um, and it was a, a movie that uh, it's one of those um, 
my teenage daughters, they were teenagers at the time, had brought it home for the school holidays. And they were, their cousins were staying with them about the same age. And they brought it home from the video store. Um, and the four of them sat on the couch and I thought I'd just check it, make sure it was suitable. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I ended up watching the whole movie. It's a great, great movie. So it's um, Good Sister, Bad Sister, yeah. Redemption Flick. One of the finest in that, in that genre I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and Cameron Diaz plays the bad sister. Um, Tony Collette's the good. But Cameron Diaz comes good at the end. Right. And at the end of the movie, she recites this poem by E.E. E. Cummings, American poet, um, called I Carry My Heart With Your Heart, which I'd never heard before. And a beautiful poem. So I ended up using some of the lines in a song called The Foggy Fields of France. So the new album is called um, uh, Spring and Fall. What uh, inspired this? What was the spark that, that set this one into motion? Uh, I hadn't written uh, songs for a while because I, I wrote the book that you're talking about. So mm. it sort of stopped me from writing songs for a couple of years. And what really got me going was when I, uh, I decided to make it a, a song cycle, which is just a fancy way of saying if you put all the song, if you put songs together, they tell a story. Right. And I had a couple of old songs that were like um, the, th those two different points, which I knew if I could get from uh, one, one, one point to the other and uh, uh, tell us, have the songs in between tell a story. And so what happens when you take it on tour? Do you, do you pick and choose songs from the album or do you play it all as a whole? We're about to go out and t tour in a couple of weeks, so we're going to play that spring and fall straight through, the right. first, first, first bit, and then, um, then old songs in the second half. Yeah, and you've just been touring the States as well, is that right? Yeah, we did that the same, did it the same way. How do the crowds react to, to you in the States? Do they have the same kind of fervour that the Australian crowds have? Uh, yeah, well, they're, they're pretty, um, they probably get to see me less often, so they're, yeah, they're pretty keen you know, by the time they get there. Right. Yeah. The, like, can I say, when I was based in Washington, D.C., I saw Paul, I think it was at the 9.30 Club in Washington, and... Um, when you're an Australian living overseas and Paul Kelly or Neil Finn or somebody like that comes through, it's just your own little bit of home right there. It's really quite moving, actually, when you go to something. And they're often in a smaller venue than you would have see you yeah. here. Mm, yeah. And so you feel really close to it. It's really, it just makes you so homesick but also happy and nostalgic at the same time. I had a similar thing at the uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, I think in 1999 you were playing the Spiegel Tent. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was the night after the festival and I turned up with Will Anderson uh, and a few other comics and we were watching you and it was just, we'd finished the festival and it was that same thing, we're away from home, we're watching Paul Kelly, it was the first time I'd ever seen you live. And at one point, I will never forget this, you said, I've got a friend in the crowd who's a cricket fan and I'm gonna play a song for him. And Will Anderson turned to me and said, if he plays Bradman, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> And you started playing Bradman. And it was this amazing moment of all the places in the world to be connecting with that song in Edinburgh. And I will never forget this, about two or three verses in, you actually stopped and said, what's the next line? And then you play one more verse, and I swear to God you went, oh, this song's too fucking long. <laughs> and then you just stopped and played something else. <laughs> Well, I'm the only right. thing more Aussie than you playing that song in Edinburgh was to get bored of it halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. It's a, it's a long song. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that particular night? Or does... I don't remember that. No, I don't remember that. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Pass on my apologies to um, Will. Because you talk about a thing in your book called The Pretendies that you go through when you're on stage. I probably had the pretendies doing that, yeah. Can you explain what the pretendies are? When you're doing what you're, you're supposed to be, what your job is, and you, you, you feel like a complete fake. And does that happen when you're playing? Sometimes, yeah. Really? Yeah. And so that, you, you can it's be... It's sort of like you, you get above yourself and you're playing a song and, uh, and you start looking at yourself. It's sort of like saying, hey, when you're riding the bike, hey, and you say, hey, mum, look, no hands. As soon as you say that, you, you, you crash. Right. It's and sort of just, and it's, it gets, it's contagious if you're playing with a band, it's, you know, if you, one person gets it, the others start picking up on it. And then what happens? Everyone puts, puts their heads down and just play, <laughs> tries to play their way out of it. Do you no? get the pretendies, Lee, when you're interviewing? I think it's, um, it's not just, I think, at work, I think it's in life. It's that feeling that you're about to be exposed as a fraud, um, that everyone's about to realise that, you know, who, who am I? Like, I sometimes think of myself, I'm just some little freckle-faced brat from the back blocks of... Brisbane and I'm interviewing the Prime Minister and you sort of have that feeling that 
you're a fraud or something um, when doing it. And I also get panic stricken thinking, can I do it? Um, you know, ahead of doing very difficult interviews or like that broadcast on the leadership spell night. I, I really am in a bit of an anxious state before I have to do it, thinking, I hope I can do it. Right. I and don't think I've ever not had them. <laughs> I think that's my default position. <laughs> you, ever, you would have them. Oh, I'm having one right now. <laughs> Jeez, I hope that I ain't asked me that question. <laughs> Do you ever have that thing where you become fixated by someone in the audience and the way they're reacting to a song or your show and you can't take your eyes off them? Not so much. <laughs> uh, sometimes there's someone's asleep in the front row or, you know, I've had that before. Yeah. You know, someone's been dragged along by... And, and you always want to wake them up. <laughs> yeah. And do you or do you let them no. sleep? Yeah. Once you're asleep, usually they're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, it says in the book that sometimes you feel that when, you, when you're singing How to Make Gravy and that there are people in the audience who are stone-faced and they're not kind of... You, you want to uh, sing them to laugh. Is it true that How to Make Gravy, which is one of your most beautiful and touching songs, was actually written to be kind of funny? Well, How to Make Gravy was, yeah. I probably thought it was more towards the comedy side of things, but um, people tell me that's not so. <laughs> the guy's in jail. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, he's giving his brother a recipe of the gravy over the phone. Isn't it funny? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I thought that when I was watching in the, in the movie, the documentary that was made of you, Stories of Me, there's footage of you at Falls Festival, uh, and one particular bit stands out. You're singing um, Deeper Water, which is a beautiful song about, a, you know, a child growing up and then getting married and, and having a child of his own and then his wife passes away and he have to, has Spoiler to... Spoiler alert! <laughs> this and the Cameron Diaz movie, they're all ruined now. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, and I mean, it's beautiful. The lyrics are absolutely beautiful. But I was watching you sing this at the Falls Festival and there are all these, like, drunk 17-year-olds going, yeah, deep water! How does it feel when you're singing those lyrics and you're watching people and thinking... I'm sure you're actually catching on to where I'm heading with this. Oh, you've put your songs out there and it's not, it's not up to you to, to, to say how they should be heard. I mean, people listen to music all different ways, you know. They, li they listen to it, you know, they get drunk and listen to music. People listen to music to do housework. People listen to music at a dinner party. They listen, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the one they love. I mean, m music is very functional, so... And once you put it out there, people are free to use it any way they want. So the new song you're singing tonight, which is from the album, it's called um, uh, Someone New, and it starts with the line, I just want to sleep with someone new. Now, that's a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just ruined that for you. How do audiences react when they hear that line at the beginning of a song? Well, let's see, shall we? <laughs> is that, are you dropping hints? Because I always see comedians that, like, they do bits and you just know they're doing the bit to let people know that they're available to kiss later. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> Is that what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Have you ever watched a comedian just think, oh, you just wrote this to like, they'll be like, talking about like, how heartbroken they are since their like, last relationship and how no one loves them. And you're just like, oh no, you're just saying this so that. Meet me at the backstage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how the song goes. Uh, you're going to play it for us tonight, someone new? Yeah. If you'd like to make your way over to the stage area, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Kelly. <laughs> Would you please thank all our guests for tonight? Lee Sales! <laughs> Josh Thomas! <laughs> Rusty and another guy! <laughs> Molly Ringwald! <laughs> and of course, Hannah Gadsby! <laughs> Next week we'll be joined by comedian Peter Hellier and the stars of the new film The World's End, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Plus there'll be music from The Bedroom Philosopher and a one-on-one -on -one chat with the rock star of science, Professor Brian Cox. <laughs> We leave you tonight, though, with Paul Kelly performing the song from his album Spring and Fall. This is Someone New. Thanks for watching Adam Hill tonight. See you next week. I just want to sleep with someone new Someone I never met Knowing it's a foolish thing to do And sure to cause regret There is no reason to do Our love wrong When we're 
together It's sweet and strong It's where I belong I just want to sleep with someone new Who doesn't know my name Who comes and takes my hand Out of the blue Just like in a dream Hearts in a doorway Right Any train Walk into any room And beauty stakes its claim And drives it home Again and again I just want to sleep with someone new Just want to sleep with someone else Touch some different skin To do or not to do Is both ways false But one's a greater sin I'm not about to Tear this house down And I couldn't stand to Sneak around Lose his love I found So daily I will make her someone new 